showtime. everyone to the Rosie and Bill show. Our guest this week overcame a difficult childhood in the Philippines and eventually came to the United States to pursue his dreams. And over the years, his hard work and perseverance led to his life becoming a true American success story. Please welcome to the Rosie and Bill show, the founder of Shine On Hollywood Magazine and the Shine On family of businesses, Arnold Garcia. Arnold, welcome to the show. Hello, Rosie and Bill. Bill, thank you so much for the introduction. Great to hear. Uh, great to meet you too. Arnold, you know, um, I know that you're from the Philippines, and I understand that you had a tough time growing up. You had a lot of challenges to face. Can you share some of that experience with us? <laughs> Where do I begin? Um, well, unfortunately. I'm not sure if I should say this, in the Filipino culture, the darker you are, the less superior you are, the lighter you are, the more superior you are. And I'm the darkest and the ugliest in a family out of 10 siblings. And um, they're all light skinned and complected, light complected, and there are basically mestizos, they call it. So, but I, I know that's typical, but my family basically, you know, I, my father was a um, very self-destructive person, very unhappy, uh, started drinking a lot. And he was, um, you know, good looking guy, light skin. My mom uh, from the Philippines, darker skin, light skin too. Um, very pretty woman, but in the Filipino looking. My dad's part Spanish. And so they has that light complected. My mom came from a very a wealthy family. And my dad came from a middle class. Um, see, my mom came from, um, the family came from the government. So she was the only child. And so my grandfather was very, very protective of her. She, he wanted me, her to be uh, married somebody who's in, on the same race. And, um, and of course, he got pregnant before um, marriage. And that's a no-no in the Filipino culture because the Catholic, no. Um, so I happen to look like my grandfather, my, which my grandfather disliked my, my father. So that was that division between the two. So my dad, um, um, but he hated me for that because I look like my grandfather and they, and so, um, basically disowned me and, um, said a lot of things that I shouldn't exist in this world that I was too ugly and I was should not be representing the, company, um, the family. So unfortunately, when I was five or six years old, I used to get beat up by my father and my brothers, my dad used to instigate the fight. So I'm the uh, person that I always get picked on and a lot of abuse mentally, physically, a lot of physical and a lot of verbal abuse. So I am, um, I um, ran away many times from the Philippines. And then of course, um, when you go outside the Philippines, there's a civil war going on. And there's this Muslim versus Catholic and there's a lot of things going on. Everyone's getting killed, <laughs> started um, shot. And it's such a bad graphic when I, I don't have to describe it. And it's, a high, it's, it's like, it, it, of course, you have to find a way to feed yourself and, and sleep somewhere and hide somewhere. So I would um, avoid a lot of uh, area that are, you know, that there's, there's a lot of commotion going on and there's like bombing and there's gun shooting. And I'm like, I got to go somewhere. So I would hide to a cemetery and... Um, and because hardly anybody goes there, but uh, there are people there. But at nighttime, I could just sleep there. 
and and these and um, I would um, um, collect garbage. I mean metals and bottles, plastic, things like that to uh, make extra money to feed myself. But there wasn't enough. That's not enough to even buy anything. So I had to go clean up some jeeps. You know we have this jeep thing, and I was very young. And um, so I never really begged for money or anything like that. I, I don't know why I had that pride that I would I would do whatever it takes for me to survive without asking any help from others out there. Because if they do, I felt like they're they have an agenda. And um I've been through that a lot as as I get older. And um so it's it, it's in a, I wasn't just in a surviving mode. So there's many, many times I had to go back home and and just take the beating because it's safer and I have food. And um, it's it's a, it's a tough it's a tough story to tell, oh. and I um, learned a lot. I grew up fast, and um, I uh, I decided to um, you know uh, toughen it and take all the beating, and uh, so I um, didn't know any better because I was too young. Uh, sorry. It's heartbreaking what you had to endure. No little child should have to endure that. You are precious just for the fact that you were born. And and I'm sorry that you had to be the recipient of that. Yes. But I knew it was temporary. It wasn't permanent. It gave me hope. And I, I kept that on my head. And... Um, Somehow, um, my my mom decided to come to the United States, and um, my dad said, "Everyone goes except Arnold." And my mom said, "No, he's going." And my mom fought for me, and she said, um, "My dad goes as long as our servant." My mom agreed to that just to get me here. So I I grateful for my mom. So moved to Napa Valley in Northern California in 73. And when we got to the airport, I, I knew it was different. The weather's changed. I mean, environment changed. And just, it's not a third world country. And I felt like I kissed the ground. I kissed the ground. I said, God, thank you, you know? And I was too young to feel of anything, what's going on with my head, except did I deserve this? But I, I knew I was, I felt like I was guided to the right direction. And so moved to Napa Valley and then my dad was always drunk, great problems all the time. Always beat up my mom, beat everybody up, including me, um, never happy. So he never worked on his life. My mom always worked, the one who brings the you know, bread and butter and everything in the, in the, in the family. So. Um, I stay in my room, captivated in my room and not allowed to come out, not allowed to play with people on the street, not allowed to play with my family, my brothers and sisters. Um, I was just inside for years in my room. I share a room with two brothers and, uh, but they're always gone. So I'm always inside there. The only thing I have at that time was that little transistor radio that I found when I was I went to school and I fixed it. And I would, um, so I would listen. That's my outside door to the world. I mean, listening is music. So the music heals me a lot. I love music. So um, I um, it came down to this. Um, there's one time that my dad came back and banged into the door. I don't know if I have much I could say about this. And then every one of my brothers and sisters, my brothers like hit it under the bed or closet. And I said, you guys, we're gonna have to help mom. Mom's getting beat up. So we have to come out there. They said, Arnold, don't go out there because mom said, don't interfere. You gotta stay here. I said, no. So I went out on the kitchen and started slamming the kitchen door to distract my dad from beating my mom up. And so he came to the kitchen and I took all the beating. Um, I, I got, I feel good. It felt good. It felt good that he's not hurting my mom anymore. So I, I rather take all the pain than just um, 
seeing my mom get beat up by my father. So I, um, again, as I got old and I realized my dad was have this disease called alcohol and um, there was no help at the time and he was hurting badly. So I took the time to understand my father's pain. He was going through a lot of pain. And my mom, because he says Catholics, he won't divorce my father. But my father made my life merciful more because he knew that he knew that the only way he can get me out of the home is keep beating up my mom. And so I would, um, so my dad would, um, <laughs> my mom, I would run away. My mom, just because my dad's after me, he's trying to kill me. But in the, here in the United States, you can't just kill me because in the Philippines, you can do that because, you know, we're not, we're not, we're not ID. Uh, they don't care. Here, <laughs> he would go to jail. So he would try to drown me in the bathtub. He would shoot me. He would um, do anything accidentally in my life uh, because I was resisting against him as my mom and my brothers were doing nothing. So anyway, I was forced to move out when I was 13. So I, um, I would um, just on the street and I learned how to survive in the Philippines. So I started collecting garbage, like electronics and furnitures, and I would um, sell it to swap and make extra money there. Because when I was going to junior high school, I was wearing the same clothes, holy, holy clothes. And the kids would make fun of me and they bully me. And it was really nonstop. It's just, wow. And I continue to, believe that this is temporary. I think that's what saved me the most, is that key word, temporary, temporary, temporary. And I have faith in myself. I grew up real quick, I grew up fast, and I learned how to make money. I was a paper boy, got up, got up at four o'clock in the morning, throw a newspaper, wrap newspaper, throw on, well, I don't care if it's dangerous, or because we moved to Vallejo, which is not a good neighborhood after Napa Valley, we moved to Vallejo, it's right next city. So, it was um, until, and then my mom moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And, um, and I was, my dad was away. That's why I'm able to move over there and not only temporary. And then we ended up coming back to California. So um, in Camarillo, my mom worked in the mental health hospital, Camarillo State Hospital. So she, I volunteered for about a year. Um, I become, um, I volunteered for about a year, for 16 hours, they provided me home and three meals a day. And that was like luxury for me. While I'm going to high school, it's 10 miles away. I would walk 10 miles every day. I mean, 20 miles back and forth. And I was a loner. I don't have, a, I, don't, I didn't speak English, one word of English. So I just continued to, my journey um, alone. And I realized there's no way, there's no coming back home. You're alone. And I want my family to be in peace with not get up in that chaos world. So I went ahead and started, um, Camry State Hospital, Mental Health Hospital changed. It was my turning point in my life. It gave me hope, it gave me opportunities, it gave me everything. I learned about people, as I learned about them, I learned a lot about me. So I learned how to forget, move on, and strive in life. So I started focusing on school, Focus. And once I started building that confidence about me, that, hey, you're going in the right direction, you know, continue to do so. And, and I, I just, like, I mean, challenged, I've been challenged in so many ways that I don't, I, what I do for work right now is tell people a story, you know, arts entertainment, right? And it's, I've never compared my story to anybody because I've always interested in how they tell the story when I key when I eat them. And I want to go there Why I went to um, uh, um, Shannon Howell magazine because I was inspired by people's stories. I was inspired by their, how they overcome some of the resistance and how they go by it. Because I've always wanted to learn and also how I can impact the world in a better place when it comes to telling stories about their stories to the world. So um, I um, somehow, and in the, in the, in the, I worked in the mental health hospital for seven and a half years. 
Um, and then I got hurt and then I went to the computer industry. And um, I've been, I was in the computer industry for 27 years, but I was also in the arts entertainment since in 78, I was a dancer. And then I got into modeling and just, uh, as a singer. And, um, and then I traveled around the world and performed 30,000 people and everywhere. And my music hit number one in dance charts, made it a granny, I made it to uh, MTV, I made it to everywhere. I realized that this country, there's no limitation. The only limitation is you. Hmm. It's when you're not putting enough on yourself and victimize yourself and blame other people, you're not gonna get nowhere. Oh you my gosh, to- Arnold, I have to interrupt you. I mean, you are such an inspiration. I can't even believe what you have overcome you're such an example of empowerment and like you said not be a, being a victim of your circumstances no and the fact that you the thing that impresses me the most and there's a lot that impresses me the fact that you were able to learn how to forgive yes, yes. everything that you were a child you were a victim, but you chose not to perpetuate that mentality. And it sounds to me like it just opened the entire world up to you. I owe my life to this country and the people. The people are the one who built me. They challenged me, they gave me compliment in every levels and made me gave it gave me a reason to rebuild me. And it made me who I am today. It, um, it hurts me when people hurt themselves. Of course. It hurts me when the people are not doing anything about it except waiting for somebody to fix them. Yeah. Arnold, how did you go from paper boy to owner of Shine on Hollywood magazine and millionaire? <laughs> well, thank you for asking I, that. I, I'm just like, I, I'm speechless. Uh, I, I, uh, I, like I said, I work, I work in the mental health from, from 77, 78 to all the, way, all the way to 84. And then the computer industry is just, you know, being introduced. So I went ahead and started taking classes for, because you know, I always love electronics because I would fix them and sell them. Right? So I'm always, you know, intrigued by that. So I um, got into computer industry. And I, I took some classes. I've become a tech support, and then I've become a system analyst. And I, I have to tell you, Rosie, it's like going to school was a, such a freedom that I didn't have in the Philippines. It was a joy that, thank you, God, for giving me the opportunity to learn, so I can strive, I can learn more about how to work on this world, and how can I take this world in a better place with myself. And this country, it's amazing. I love this country. And people like you and a lot of people out there, Americans, that are, I'm not, I have no anger against Filipinos. I have no anger against my father. I let that go. In order for me to strive in life, I have to. So I went from uh, mental health out I went to um, computer industry, I love it. And then I become, and I didn't, I hardly speak English. And then I basically learned I, I, I taught myself how to speak English and I kept reading books and I kept recording myself. How can I pronunciate this word better? Because of my, my mental about helping customers and giving them what they need to really feel comfortable buying from me. Because I got after system analysts, because I used to work for Baxter's Pharmacy. It's the biggest pharmaceutical company, you know, 
Johnson mm -hmm. Johnson's a competition. So I was a system analyst. If anything in the system goes down, I have to let everybody know, I'm gonna bring the system down, reboot, da da da. So I was that person. And so, and then I graduated from that to sales and marketing. And this lady goes, the head donor said, you want, do you ever wanna be, do you ever get into sales? Me? I don't speak English correctly. So really? She goes, yeah, I think you have a personality. You have a good personality. I think people will like you. Because of her, she got me to Marisol, like in, in group micro with hardware and software in Southern California. And then I moved to Northern California. And that's when I started working for these big companies, uh, Fortune 500 companies. And that became in demand because my I always ex exceeded my quota and, and, my, and my numbers. And every customer wants to talk to me. They always dial for me instead of that rep, other reps. And then I get in trouble. They think I'm stealing their accounts. I said, no, I, I take orders. Even I, they should be supposed to take in orders, but I put their sales code number. So they get the order credit. I get nothing. What's the problem? What's the problem with this? Because they're not picking up the phone. I do. And they call me and product knowledge is so important. And so they call me because I'm so expert when it comes to product knowledge and compare it with other out there. And I help them. I say, you don't need to spend $3,500 in system. It's going to become obsolete in three years. What are you going to use it for? So I talk to my customer, let them know. So anyway, they love that idea that I'm, I consult to them. I want the best for them, not because I want to meet my numbers every month, but because of that, people talk and, and refer me to, and they start calling me. And so, but the problem with the companies that work with the, um, on, the, on the computer industry, they're not taking care of the customer after the sale, you know, and, and people are getting frustrated. So I would, and I realized what's the problem with the industry is that it's lacking. So what I did, I, I, I formed my own computer company. It's called Microplus Technology. Oh, but before that, I was in demand where other companies trying to hire me. How much they pay you? You want to come to my work for my company? Da, da, da. So I'm, I was making over $100,000 in the 90s. And then I used that money to stay to open my own company. And every those customers, and then when I opened Microfresh Technology, I didn't tell them I, I was the owner of the company. I told them I, I found this company and I told them they, it's an American company, it's not a Chinese company. I'm sorry to say this because back then the Chinese don't take care of the customers at all. They just want to push box at the door, push box at the door. So, anyways, I went ahead and formed my computer company and everyone started buying from me. In less than six months, I become a millionaire. I had I had a situation, a health situation in, in San Francisco when I was living in Northern California, three months, and I had to move back here. I sold my house over there and I bought a house in the valley. Um, and then of course, one led to another, I have cancer. I don't know if I should say that. Um, so there's other illnesses. So I uh, basically said, I can't sustain this company anymore. So I had to give it up. And, um, and then I become homeless again and in the mid 2000 for three years. And I was sleeping in my car. And uh, so I went ahead, um, crashed in somebody's kitchen. I paid $400 to pay to live in the kitchen, sleep in the kitchen. So I took on it. I lost a lot of friends that I had a lot of friends when I was a millionaire. And then I become nothing broke and I had to go bankrupt everything. And so, and then I got into my music and I, and then all the other stuff, it kind of built me up. And then I, I, I was doing really well in the music industry. And then I, I started talking to a lot of young, the new the kids are trying to come into the industry and they've been screwed left and right. And, and I, I decided to, to, to step down on my music and help these kids, educate them about the industry the business side of it and develop them to be a, a so what I did I have to sing in contest. It was amazing kissing contest. And we basically uh, prepped them to get to the American Idol at the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then it, there was a mentorship program that I put together. So that's how I earned my credibility in the industry, in the alternative in the industry. And then after that, they stole my concept. And then my music 
the part of the reason I stepped down because my music and the million dollars was in Bessel. The, and the industry is so finicky. So I did something about that. Instead of promoting me, I want to be able to help the people, other kids out there, inspire them in a way that, you know, listen, I know you want to be a star, but there's a lot of things you need to learn about this industry to strive. You have to know this industry real well. So I learned that. So I helped them a lot. And then I decided to go born in 2012. I had a, I had meningitis and um, I died in the hospital. And a few seconds, I saw this bright light and I don't know if I should say this in public. You can bright say light it, and it was so quiet, so quiet. I, I, and I told, I told God, please, I wanna stay. I wanna stay here. I'm, I'm tired, I'm tired. I said, God gave me, um, said to me, I want you to protect my creation. And I said, I don't know. I, and then next time I know I was in the covered room and then I went to my uh, um, my room. And the first thing I asked my nurse, was my, can I have my laptop please? And that's when I born Shannon Howe Magazine. I would never thought I would be a publisher. And my English is not that great. My writing is not that great, but I made it happen and become the fastest growing publication in the world up there. That's why up there. Aida Takla O'Reilly was the president of the Hollywood Foreign Press Golden Glove. She would have written a testimony to me. It was just such a beautiful testimony. I'd like to read it to you, or unless it's okay, maybe I don't want to take out so much time, but- Please, Arnold, please, re please read it. So here's what Aida have to say about the magazine. <laughs> Dear Mr. Garcia, I have been in the world of journalism for a long time and so gradual deterioration in reporting and communicating with people. It went from reporting to protect, uh, projecting, from facts, gossip, from balance to sensationalism. I was turned off from reading the newspaper and media. Oh, then, you, then you came along and touched my life. You made it your mission to bring the world the stories of real people instead of news of the extraordinary rich doing ordinary things. You went to ordinary people doing the extraordinary things. Instead of taking an easy road, you took the road less traveled and demonstrated how magnificently real people rise and shine. You set the standard for what journalism and reporting it's all about. You have raised the bar. Thank you, Arnold Garcia and Shannon, the magazine team, for dedicating your time and talent to what is really important in life. My goodness. I ate a talk about writer, former two times president and current trustee of the Hollow Foreign Press Association Golden Glove Awards. It was absolutely fantastic. And you know, you you mentioned something before you read the testimonial that I think actually backs up that testimonial a lot, which is that you've got the fastest growing publication in the world. So it's not just not just the testimonials, but it's really catching on. So there's there's really something to that. I mean, how does that feel? Did you have any idea when you started this? I know the story behind the inspiration for starting it is just absolutely beautiful. But oh, did you have you any so idea much. that it could be where it's at and take this path that it's taken? In 2012, God had told me to remove politics, religion, and sex orientation. I got really tired of what Hollywood producing out there, the gossip, negative gossip. It really divides people. And now today is much more important ever. The religion, politics, sex orientation, those things that divide us. And so God wants me to... Uh, to really eliminate that so I can, I can reach to all of them, stay neutral. So I have no backlash because of those. So I feel like I'm doing service for the community that I love and the people I love and this country I love. Yeah. Arnold, you know, it, it reminds me of that saying of Gandhi's, which is be the change you want to see in the world. And, and that is you. I mean, you are a, a bright light and you need to take care of yourself because we need you here. <laughs> Thank you, Rosie. It's oh my like gosh. my mom. I mean, sorry, Rosie, it's like my mom. I love my mom. And 
Aww. God bless her. I love my father too. He went through a lot of pain and you have to forgive. You have to understand why people go through pain. You can't just easily judge them because when you judge people, because you're not, you can't judge yourself. Well, that's a lot of spiritual maturity you have right there. And, and thank you for sharing that because that's a perspective that I think that we can all benefit from. And we are just so, you know, genuinely happy to have you on the show because you are, you're not only inspirational, but you're just such a truthful person. You know, you really live your truth. And um, that's, that means a lot. It really does. And that's why people gravitate toward you and, and what you do and, and, and need your help and they seek your help. And uh, we wish you all the best. We'd love to have okay. you come back and talk to us again. And uh, yeah, just keep doing what you're doing, Arnold. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm.